Hi, welcome, welcome to Home Keepers. Come right on in, my friend. We've been waiting for you. Hope you're having a wonderful day. I'll tell you right off the top, I got, got a little head cold just from here to here, and I'm feeling fine, but I sound kind of weird. So uh, if I'm sucking a uh, cough drop, think nothing of it in this program, because it's gonna be a great program. I have an attorney here, Jenna Ellis, from my home state of Colorado. If you watch very much, you know how much I love Colorado. It's the most beautiful place. Anytime I go back, you know, and you're flying over those Rocky Mountains, I know I'm home. And so um, that's where Jenna is from. She teaches law, and also we're going to talk about her book, which should really mean a lot to everybody watching, The Legal Basis for a Moral Constitution. And uh, as I met her just a few minutes ago, and I said, I don't think there's ever been a book quite like this. And we kind of agreed that that moral law that's really kind of built into our Constitution is, is being watered down and in many cases just done away with. I'm glad she's put the spotlight on this. So I want you to meet her. And I'm going to join Stephanie. We're going to make a creamy chicken gnocchi soup. And um, we had to look up and see what gnocchi is. <laughs> so we'll tell you. This, we, we just want to educate you. You know how it is. But before I join her, I've got a, a new offer for you. A cookbook by Deborah Cody, and she's been on with me before. She's absolutely delightful. A very, very uh, strong writer in the Christian uh, books. And uh, this is a cookbook called Too Blessed to be Stressed. And it has, I believe, the idea is that you can fix everything in here within 20 minutes. And uh, she's going to be coming on the show in a few weeks uh, to do a couple of these for us. But I want to offer it to you today for a gift of at least $20 to the program. And that includes your shipping and handling. And if you use credit card or debit card, uh, call 1-800-229-0059 or write to me at Homekeepers, Box 6922, Clearwater, Florida, 33758, and we will get it out to you. You know, it's one of those books you can open flat on your countertop, and I think you can even wipe off the pages that you spill food on which is very important to Stephanie. Isn't that true? Sure. Yeah. Um, do you ever get food on your cookbooks? I do. They're <laughs> nice and messy. <laughs> how are you today? Good. How are you doing? Good. And we got ourselves educated on gnocchi. gnocchi. Mm -hmm. Tell them what it is. It's a potato dumpling is what they call it. And you thought it might be German. It's actually a, like of Italian mm -hmm. origin, but it's deliciousness. Is uh, it and is. this is this is kind of, I'll just take one out and show it to them. Yeah. That's what it looks like, yeah. um, and you get it in the uh, in your pasta department. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. that's what it looks like. It looks like a little bit ba little baby potato. Okay, yeah. okay. So we had um, some. We had three a, a pound of skinless chicken breasts. We chopped up and we sautéed and browned. Okay, and then I have two tablespoons of butter in here. I have a small onion. I'm going to put in, mm -hmm. and I'm chopping up. Um, um, Spinach, spinach making a little bit smaller. I have a medium carrot that is um, grated up. I have a stalk of celery. Celery. And I have two garlic cloves minced. Can you remember in your whole life you ever eat gnocchi? I don't think I've ever eaten it. I've seen it cooked many times, like because I, yeah. I I'm always watching cooking shows on TV. Oh yeah. You know always. I've and often I, wondered I've, what the ratings are on the Food Network because it's so fascinating. Oh yeah, it's I, I watch Such it a variety. all. I mean, if I have a choice, that's pretty much what I'm watching. Usually. Yeah. So you're gonna just want to saute this up and soften it a little bit, and then we're gonna take a third of a cup of flour and we're gonna make. Gonna thicken it up mm -hmm, a little. Thicken bit. it up a little bit, and then we have people want um, the amounts, so I'm trying uh -huh. my best to give the amounts. Uh -huh. So we have three and a half cups of milk, mm -hmm. and we have one and a half cups of heavy whipping cream. Oh. Boy. Okay, so we're going to put all that in. Mm. And then we have a tablespoon of chicken bouillon granules. Got that. We have pepper, the gnocchi, which mm. is just one package. It was one 16-ounce package. And then we have, it's supposed to be a half a cup, but we're adding a little extra. Of the, uh, of the just a half a cup? Yeah. Well, that's not much. Okay, no, we'll, we'll much play that by ear. Yeah. So Let's you want this to cook a lot longer, but we're going to do a little speed cooking here. We teach them how to speed cook. Yes, we girl. we're good at speed cooking. So I'm going to put the flour in and just let it cook for just a minute because you don't, you want that flour taste. To yeah, come out. this um, this is actually 
the first program we're making after Christmas. Yes, yes. We're, and you know what? I, I can't, today's Thursday. I came back to work on Tuesday, uh -huh. and I think my brain has started to come back today. Amen. But I was sitting upstairs and totally forgot that we were taping a show at all, so well, it's it, not 100%. The brain is not my back. brain is still back in its jammies. Mm -hmm. On the couch, my mm -hmm. body is here. <laughs> yeah, you know, she takes off two weeks at Christmas time mm -hmm. and tells us she's not going to get out of her pajamas. So I came in that here, I had to come in here one day for a few minutes and oh. I wore my pajamas. <laughs> I did, yes. <laughs> I, I said I wasn't getting out of them, and I meant it. Well, I had a, a wonderful Christmas. I flew to Montgomery, Alabama, where my son is a pastor. I'm going to put in the whipping yeah. cream and all the milk. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I used to fly every weekend. Can you know? <sighs> and I couldn't do it now. Yeah. It's awful. Yeah. It's nothing if you want like to feel like a member of a herd of cattle, yes. just go to the airport. Especially with all the security now and everything. I had to go through Atlanta, and I tell you, it was <laughs> a nightmare. Yeah, an and if, you know what's so funny is I typically, the only time I travel by plane, I travel with Bob DeAndre, yeah. the president and founder, uh -huh. to different um, station managers' meetings, and he always gets picked out to get checked. It's hysterical to me. So funny. <laughs> I'm going right through, and he's over there like this, being like old. <laughs> I know, and a lot of you have seen Bob. I, I think he'd be the last oh, one. Oh, it out. makes me, I just sit there and I just laugh at him because I think that's his, I'm like, really? Really? No. <laughs> Do you know, I flew the first day that they opened up flying mm -hmm. after 9 11. That, right. was, that was weird. That was weird. There were about three yeah. of us on this big plane, and most of the airport wasn't open. That's, and I and then to compare Atlanta so... on Christmas. Oh. oh yeah, yeah. Let's put the chicken in and get it warmed up. Okay. I have this. We heat. already. Uh, I have the heat. Kind of fried the chicken a little bit. Yep. I have the it. heat cranked. I just needed to get a little warm because that that milk mm -hmm. was cold. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna go ahead and put the gnocchi in. We'll just get everything warmed up. And then the last thing you put in is the spinach. Uh, the spinach. Yeah. So I got a. I guess that's a half a cup. <laughs> Why bother? I mean, let's put more. <laughs> right. Um, I'll eat that spinach. Don't worry. Okay. I eat a lot of spinach. Okay. I got this crank. So it'll... I'm telling you, this is an entree. This isn't just some. Oh kind yeah, of a this is going to be good. Soup. And it really needs to thick. It'll thicken up, especially with mm -hmm. the flour and everything. We just don't have time mm -hmm. for. You have someone special to talk to, so we need to get. Boy, to we that. have an interesting subject today. Um, I've got five pages of questions. Oh wow! And uh, lots of prep. I think that's the most... Uh, I hope you're ready for this. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's just a subject right down my alley. Earthling R Rippy's very inquisitive. She's very yeah. good with the questions. Well, I'm not that brilliant on the Supreme Court, but I'm smart enough to know that they're taking a lot of cases. They shouldn't shouldn't even be there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm just going to have you taste. Yeah, I'll just have okay. a little taste, yeah. but I have it a feeling. It should cook so much longer. This is going to be my I want to get you. Oh, here. Here's a gnocchi right there. There's a gnocchi? Yep. Okay. I'm just trying to get a bite. Because I keep wondering if they're going to taste like pasta or. It tastes a little like a potato. Does it? Let me tell you. How's the soup? That delicious. is Delicious. Mm. So creamy. Yeah, this is an entree. That's really good. You can fix yourself a little salad, a yeah. good hard roll. You've got it made. Oh, man, that soup is tasty. That is For so For what little we good. put in here. So my friend, it's called mm. Creamy Chicken Gnocchi Soup. Oh, I want to mention something else. Uh, I didn't mean to slap <laughs> you. But, um, we get, you, you know, we email these recipes to you when you request it. And sometimes you say you didn't get them. Sometimes... Are, they won't go back to your email address, and and we're stuck. There's nothing we can do. So uh, we do everything we can to get them to you. But if you send email, and if you don't have a computer, just write to us. The information's coming up on screen, and this one is absolutely free, of course. And it's called creamy chicken gnocchi soup. If you just put gnocchi on there, we'll probably get it. And you can spell gnocchi any way you want. Okay, stay with me. I want you to meet Jenna. You're going to love her. If you would like a copy of today's recipe, just write to the address on your screen, or you can email your request to artheline at rippy.org.
I have been looking forward to this, and I am so pleased to uh, introduce to you Jenna Ellis. Uh, she is a professor of legal studies, and uh, she teaches law at the uh, Colorado Uni Christian University. And welcome to Homekeepers. Thank you so much for having me. <laughs> she looks so young <laughs> to be a lawyer. Um, Thank you, that's kind. What kind of law did you, or did you always want to be a lawyer when you were a little girl? I did. I actually knew I wanted to be a lawyer from the time I was 14. Um, I went to a, a civic program in high school that taught how to write a legal brief and argue in front of a mock Supreme Court. And I came home from that week and told my parents, I want to be a lawyer, and never changed from that. Do you remember what you were arguing at that? It was a Fourth Amendment search and seizure issue, and so uh, the the aspect of the Constitution that talked about our rights and what uh, police can and can't do was very fascinating. But the the process to me was very fascinating in how to determine these questions, mm -hmm. and that that really interested me. Yeah. Now, when you went to school, was there a certain type of law that you wanted to practice? Initially, I wanted to do constitutional law, which I'm doing now, and then um, ultimately through law school, I also uh, gravitated toward criminal law, and that's also what I practice now. Um, I'm a former prosecutor and current criminal defense attorney. Well, now, if you're just interested interest in constitutional law, uh, where is that in the courtroom? Most of those are appellate cases or the appeals process, and so it has to start with um, some issue that um, that arises. We see a lot of different cases through um, organizations such as um, Alliance Defending Freedom or Jay Seculo and the ACLJ and those always start on a local instance and then they end up in the appeals process and ultimately in the Supreme Court. And is that where they hold them right alongside the Constitution? The case is say, okay, how does this fit? Right, and that's that's really becomes the question: is um, does the policy generally of of the state, um, the, does the law actually fall in line? Is it constitutional, and does that um, ultimately is that okay within the American jurisprudential um, outcome? Mm -hmm. um, is the fact that we've strayed so far from really a moral law that uh, just propelled you to write the book? Yeah, so when I went into law school, um, of course, law is taught from um, this idea that whatever the Supreme Court says is ultimately true and accurate. And often we uh, we ask the question, is a law constitutional? But we don't ask the question, um, what, where does the Constitution get its authority? And so coming in, uh, being taught that whatever the Supreme Court says, that ultimately is gospel on the Constitution, mm -hmm didn't sit well with me and I wanted to answer the question where does mm -hmm. the Constitution get its authority from and mm -hmm. how can we actually advocate for a Christian worldview within that context so that was really the question I wanted answered and um, so I researched the book and ultimately wrote it excellent book the name of it is legal basis for a moral constitution and uh, we're going to go ahead and put up her website you can get it from there probably Amazon, Barnes yes. & Noble, all those. Yes. Uh, but let me, let me say this, that you have anybody in law school or any uh, friend who's an attorney, I would really encourage you to buy this uh, for them. It, it might be a whole avenue they've never even looked down. So. Yes, and also um, state representatives in uh, your legislature as well. Um, mm -hmm. Colorado, thankfully, we have some really good Christian advocates, mm -hmm. and um, they've also obtained copies of the book to give to fellow uh, legislators, and it's really good for educational purposes mm -hmm. as well. Because uh, she's done the research for you. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay, you co you coach a moot court team. What is that? Yes. I think I know what moot means, but maybe... Y yes, so so it's kind of a, it's a mock Supreme Court setting, and so my students will go in front of a panel of judges with um, a case that they are presenting, and the idea of moot court is just a legal term mm -hmm. that means we're practicing in front of the court, and they'll actually get to present their mm -hmm. arguments in front of that panel. Mm -hmm. Now... What, was there any, was anything specific that just prompted you to write something about the morality that is really built in 
to the Constitution. Yes, well, if we look at the past 50 or 60 years of American history, we've seen that the social issues are really mm -hmm. forefront, um, not only in our individual lives, but in the evangelical community as a whole, things like same-sex marriage, things like abortion, um, and what should our law do with this? And my contention in the book is that all law has a moral aspect. We have our criminal laws that say what we can and can't do. Mm -hmm. We're just talking about whose morality ultimately are we legislating? And what standard is it that our law actually comes from? And so my contention is that if we look back actually not just at the Constitution, but at the Declaration of Independence, where our founder said, we hold these truths to be self-evident. Truth is, it's discoverable, all men are created equal, and they're endowed by their creator, not their government with certain rights. So our rights come from God and that ultimately is the standard. So anything within the constitutional framework has to be consistent with the idea and the philosophy that truth is and ultimately it comes from God our creator, not just what the Supreme Court or any other government agency says. And isn't it correct that the Ten Commandments are still on the walls of, of the Supreme Court. They are, We so talk far. about morality. Uh, we think it's a morality to kill people, right? right. Uh, to steal from people. Right. I, th I still believe that adultery is immoral. Absolutely. Uh, there's a whole lot of things in there. And so, to me, it's almost an oxymoron that thou shall not kill is obvious, but abortion is okay. Right, and what, what our culture has done is they're selectively enforcing and picking and choosing what principles from truth we're going to actually put into our law. And so as we've looked at the past 50 or 60 years, mm -hmm. particularly with the rise of feminism and the sexual revolution, we've wanted to become more and more free within our society, and they're using that term incorrectly, we've wanted to become free to do anything that we want in our home, including immoral acts like adultery, like homosexuality, um, like abortion, those types of choices. And so even though the Constitution does not provide any authority to the Supreme Court to uh, view cases on those issues, they have had to look at those issues and they've had to take cases and say, we want to allow our society in a progressive way um, to go ahead and make those laws. And so what they did in 1965, there's a case called Griswold v. Connecticut, it's the name of the case. Um, it was the first Planned Parenthood contraception case. So uh, again, with the sexual revolution. Should never have been at the Supreme Court anyway, should it? Not at all. And they, they knew they didn't have authority to even determine the case. Mm -hmm. So they said, we are going to not look at the text of the Constitution. We are going to literally look between the lines and this, what they called a vast penumbra, which is the light that emanates between the, the lines. And we're going to find a right for a woman to, to choose within and between the lines of the text of the Constitution. So they knew it was a legal fiction, but they went ahead and did it anyway. And all of our progressive cases thereafter have been built on that same concept that we can look between the lines of the Constitution, we can interpret and apply it any way we want, and we don't have to go back to truth. What year was that? 1965. I, I don't remember any specific jurist then. Can you name who might have let it, you know, open up the gates for it? Right, and there, you know, there were there were several, and um, the the Supreme Court panel. Um, if you look at the composition of the court, they were getting more and more liberal, mm -hmm. and um, there were a lot of um, different uh, justices that ultimately were the same that. Um, that wrote the opinion in 1973 on Roe v. Wade, which is, of course, the abortion decision, and then further on. And so, so it's interesting if we look at even today, the Supreme Court and its composition and looking at nominating a new Supreme Court justice, we look at their independent ideology and their political uh, viewpoint rather than how they interpret the Constitution as lawyers. And that's dangerous because then ultimately their political persuasions are how they look at uh, their opinions rather than the legal precedent of the Constitution. And we have watched that ever since. Now, yes. I th it seems to me I remember that Senator Ted Kennedy, before he died, talked, I think, talked about something uh, that it's a living document, a fluid document, which would mean you can change it as you go along, right? 
Right, and and what's interesting about that that whole concept is that we don't apply that same principle to any other area of law. Any other law. If you and I entered into a contract, for example, and then ten years later, uh, one of those terms I didn't agree with, we went into court, and I said, "Well, judge, you know, this is a fluid document. Yeah, this, is <laughs> this is ten years later. Don't even look at what we actually yeah. agreed to." We we would laugh, and the judge would laugh. But yet we're applying that same principle to our federal constitution and saying it Highest doesn't mean court. what it says and we're trying to bend it and flex it just to suit our current progressive whim rather than saying we know this is built on the objective principles of truth and on the inerrant word of God in scripture. I think one of the real tragedies uh, is to watch the hearings on a, a potential jurist and first of all they'll wiggle they will not give a direct answer at all, and some of them have been very careful about their paperwork, you know. Lawyers are very good at that yeah, sometimes, yeah. unfortunately. And, um, and then also uh, someone who's ultra qualified, how they'll go out and personally, or uh, I watched uh, Thomas, I watched that one. I watched uh, Judge Robert Bork, I believe he's in heaven today, but I, I've always felt that was really a loss. Yes. Because and he believed in the Constitution. Absolutely. And it's become more of a, of a partisan consideration now mm -hmm. than actually saying, is this jurist competent to look at a five-page document and understand how to apply the principles of law to different cases? It shouldn't be as complex as it is, but mm -hmm. because we look at the personality and the politics of the potential justice, then it becomes so much more on a party line basis than it was ever intended to be. I've watched them wiggle and wiggle and not answer, and um, it seems to me those that are asking the question should demand an answer. They should, and they, they should focus their questions as well on what truly matters and say, where do you believe the Constitution derives its authority? Is it something that we can bend and flex to any whim? Does it evolve? Is it fluid, as we were discussing earlier? Or do you believe and understand, as the founders did, that truth is, it's self-evident, and that there are objective principles of truth? And those are the types of questions we need to be asking. Well... What's the way back? So there is a great piece of the Constitution that has gotten a little bit more attention uh, lately in the news, and it's in Article 5, and it is the amendment process to mm -hmm. the Constitution. We've had the, um, and I talk about this in the last chapter of my book, um, and it's called a Convention of the States. So we know that the Constitution can be amended, just meaning that we can take some powers that were given to the federal government in the Constitution, give them back to the states, or redistribute them as the federal government has become irresponsible with them. And Congress can do that. They can propose amendments any day that they're in session. But Article 5 provides a different avenue. It allows the state legislatures to step into that role of Congress and propose amendments that Congress probably wouldn't. Like, for example, term limiting uh, Congress and, um, and, and making sure that there yeah, is... Term limiting the Supreme Court. That as well, absolutely. And even changing the way that um, Supreme Court justices are nominated. Rather than having it a completely federal, returning that even to the states. And so there are some very significant procedural ways that we can really genuinely affect um, our society and the way that government operates. And so there's a project called Convention of States Project. Um, your, your listeners can go and find out more about it at conventionofstates.com. And it's a nationwide movement to actually call for this convention where each of the states participate and they can step into that role and actually propose amendments. They still have to be ratified by the exact same procedure as congressional amendments, which is through three-fourths of the states. I wonder how many people in Washington, D.C. know that. I think they do, but they just, they don't want it to happen. When you have somebody <laughs> with a major bill, pages that high, say we need to pass it so we can see what's in it. Right. Which I, I don't have a whole lot of um, confidence that they even know American history. I don't, I don't think they do, and um, and you know, there's really two different constitutions that we have today. We have the original constitution, which provides limited powers to government. It's only five pages. It's not that complicated. And then we have all of the Supreme Court case law, 
and all of those precedent that are just pages and pages and thousands of pages. That's what's taught in law schools as constitutional law. It's whatever the Supreme Court says. What said. establishes case law? That is Supreme Court opinion. And so when that's handed so when down, that is, that's it. Then that's the highest court. And so uh, the the case Marbury v. Madison uh, back, it was the initial Supreme Court opinion. It established this concept of judicial review. This idea that the Supreme Court as a court can go back and review different laws, but they're not supposed to have the ability to review everything. If we look at the Constitution and we look at what the federal government actually has, in my world what we call jurisdiction, mm -hmm. what we say the Supreme Court can actually look at, it's very limited. But what the Supreme Court and an activist court has done has actually taken any case that they want to and they've said we are the final authority on it and what we say goes. That's how we ended up at the same-sex marriage decision um, back in June of 2015. Um, so Roe v. Wade would be considered case law? Yes. But that could be overturned or changed? It could. Absolutely. So we have this, um, this concept of case law precedent that as long as a Supreme Court case is still valid current law, it hasn't been overturned by another future Supreme Court, then that ultimately um, is what is fixed and in place. But what most people don't understand is that the Supreme Court can't create law. They try to. All they can do is look at a case and say, is that law constitutional or is it not? They are still under the Constitution. But what the Supreme Court, especially in the last 30 years, has done, has tried to create law and has tried to say, states, we are going to tell you, you have mm -hmm. to recognize same-sex marriage. the car before the horse there, huh? Exactly. Mm -hmm. And they're actually going well outside the scope of what they're mm -hmm. actually able to do. Uh, we are about out of time, but... Um I've invited uh, Jenna to come back because uh, this is just so rich. We barely, barely even introduced uh, it to you, but we are just about out of time. But why don't you just do a little research on your own? David Barton has, uh, Google David Barton, and you'll find rich, rich American history and God's place in it. Um, and when you begin to read, as is in Jenna's book, a lot of the things that the founders said about God, there was no question that God was involved in our Constitution and morality. And oh my, how I would like to see this great nation return to that. I know that with, all, with God, all things are possible. So when we put a light on it, maybe that's the beginning. But thanks for being with us. Join me next time. Remembering there is no higher calling than that of a homekeeper. God bless you. If you should miss a Homekeepers program, you can catch up by going to www.ctnonline.com. Click on CTN Programs and then on Homekeepers.